Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, we're going to be doing another Kahoot. We're going to be going over nursing exam exit topics. Now, it's going to be a mixed variety of questions. Um, before we get started, I'm going to ask you, please support me and support this channel by liking this video. Go ahead and give it a thumbs up. You're going to love the video. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. And be sure to check out my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. There you can sign up for a next generation NCLEX review session, both part one, part two. You can sign up for a private tutoring session. Session, just me and you, or you can sign up for a consultation session where you can pick my brain about anything. Maybe you need advice about something within the scope of nursing. Also, if you're a current nursing student, I've got audio lessons available. So I've got lots of great resources. Again, you can find those on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Almost daily, you can find me covering a variety of nursing topics across the social, across my social media platforms, right here on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. My handle's the same everywhere, Nexus Nursing. All right, guys, without any further ado, let's get started. Nursing exam exit questions. Nursing exit exam questions. All right, first question. What is the name of this rhythm? Type in your answer. And if you weren't able to make it into the room, guys, go ahead and type it into the chat. What is the name of this rhythm? What do you think you're looking at? Okay, so I'm seeing the top answers. I'm seeing um, ventricular fib, V fib. I'm seeing VTAC, A fib, <laughs> torsades to point, sinus tachy. Your mom? That's rude. You know what? All right. So the correct answer is um, V fib. All right. If you take a look at that rhythm or the rhythm that was on the screen, where was the P way? Where was the QRS complex? Nada. When your patient is in VFib, you have nothing. You have you don't have a pulse. You don't have a blood pressure. You don't have consciousness. Right. Um, nada. What we're dealing with here is VFib. So that leads us to the next question, which is. That same rhythm we just saw VFib on the ECG strip. What would be your first action? Your patients in VFib, what's the first thing you're going to do? Are you going to give oxygen? Are you going to defibrillate? Are you going to turn the patient onto their left side? Or are you going to call the healthcare provider? I don't know why it says times five, but I just meant call the healthcare provider. What is going to be your next nursing intervention when you see this? Very good. You're going to defibrillate. Absolutely. What if no defibrillators available? You're going to scream for help at the top of your lungs and you're going to start CPR immediately. Remember when you start CPR, you start with what? Compressions. All right. All right, your patient that's being discharged tells you that he can no longer afford his medications. What's the best action to take? Are you going to contact the social worker? Are you going to contact the insurance company? Are you going to request a generic version of the medications ordered? Or are you going to research alternative therapy types? What would you do if your patient that's being discharged tells you, the nurse, that he or she just can't afford their medications? Very good. You're going to contact the social worker. The job of the social worker, well, the social worker does many things, but among the many things that the social worker does, they help patients get resources in the community. So if the patient's having financial difficulties and they can't afford something, the social worker will help find those resources and get the resources for the patient. So that social worker very well may call the insurance company and see, are there any... Um, programs that they have where the patient can get the medications for free. Are there any coupons? But again, it would be the social worker. It's not going to be the nurse contacting the healthcare, 
the, excuse me, the insurance company. They don't have time for that. You're going to refer that to the social worker. They're not going to request a generic version of the medication because guess what? A generic medication, a, a generic version of the medication, number one, is still going to cost money. That's number one. And number two, you cannot just switch from generic to trade because chemically speaking, very often they may be different. So you'd be stepping outside of your scope of practice anyway. And then choice three, research alternative therapy types. You also would be stepping outside of your scope of practice. So if a medication has been ordered for your patient and your patient's telling you they can't afford it, so most likely they're not going to be taking that medication. Instead of you addressing that, you're going to be looking for different types of therapy. Absolutely not. So the correct answer is contact a social worker. The game pen is 347-248, 347-248. All right, next question. This is select all that applies. Which tasks can you delegate to the unlicensed assistive personnel, the UAP? Here are your choices. Culturing a surgical incision, collecting a sputum specimen, assisting a patient receiving bladder training, remaining with a patient on suicide precaution, obtaining vital signs from a patient that's gonna be getting digoxin, applying a cold application to the swelling of a patient's injured area. Out of all of these tasks, which one can you delegate to the UAP? Okay, so let's talk about the correct answer. What can we delegate to an unlicensed assistive personnel? And let's go in order. The first one is culturing a surgical incision. I'm happy only three people chose that. That is not the correct answer because let, let me tell you something. When you are collecting that drainage to culture, right? You need to be assessing that surgical site. You're going to be looking for signs and symptoms of infection. You're going to be looking for mucopurulent drainage. You're going to be seeing, is there a foul odor? You're going to be looking to see, is there redness? Is there inflammation? Is there heat or warmth at that site, right? So that's going to, um, you're going to keep that. That's going to be for you, the RN. And I, when you're thinking about what you can delegate to the unlicensed assistive personnel, I want you to think in terms of critical thinking. If it's something that requires critical thinking, you're not going to delegate to them. And I'm not saying that UAPs don't know how to think critically. I'm not um, talking down to them at all. I just want you to answer your questions correctly. So I want you to think of in terms of that, if it requires assessment, if it requires critical thinking, you are not going to delegate that to the UAP. Next, collecting a sputum specimen. Yep. Because what are you doing to collect a, sp sputum, a sputum specimen? It's not like you're going into the patient's throat and you're assessing and you're co collecting um, the specimen like that. You're going to have that patient cough that sputum into the specimen. So all they're doing is collecting. So yes, they can do that. Next, assist the patient receiving bladder training. Yeah, you can walk them to the toilet, assist them on the toilet. They're not doing anything that is within the nurse's scope of practice. Next, remaining with the patient um, on suicide precautions. Absolutely. If a patient's suicidal, they have to have one-on-one -on -one supervision. Even when they go to the restroom, guess who has to be there? Someone, either you or another staff, right? That door needs to be open. So you can delegate that to them. Obtaining vital signs from a patient due to receive digoxin. Yes. All they're doing is getting the vital signs. UAPs are allowed to record and report. Record the vital signs and report it to you, the nurse, or report it in the patient's chart or the flow sheet, right? They can take blood pressure. They can take pulse. They can take respirations. They cannot listen to lung sounds. Why? Listening to lung sounds requires critical thinking. You have to know the difference. Are you listening to a clear lung sound versus crackles versus wheezing versus ronchi versus rails versus strider, right? That that requires critical thinking. So no, they cannot listen to lung sounds, but they can count respiration. So absolutely, 
taking vital signs for a patient that's about to take digoxin. Let's talk about digoxin for a minute because you absolutely need to know this as well. When the patient's taking digoxin, we love digoxin. It increases the contractility of the heart. Um, it makes the heart pump out, uh, pump stronger. So more oxygenated blood is flowing to the tissues. Great. But one thing you need to know about digoxin is it decreases the heart rate, right? So when that UAP is taking the vitals and you look at those vitals, if that heart rate is 60 or less, because remember, normal is 60 to 100. And I just told you that medication decreases the heart rate. If that heart rate is 60 or less, are you going to give the digoxin? Absolutely not. You're going to withhold that medication and call the healthcare provider saying, hey, I know you ordered digoxin, but this is the heart rate. What do you want to do? Anyway, moving on. Applying a cold compress to the swelling of a patient's injured area, of course they can do that. All they're doing is applying a cold compress to an injured area that most likely there's going to be swelling, right? RICE, R-I-C-E, rest. You want to rest that area. I stands for ice, right? You want to decrease swelling. C stands for compression. And of course, E for elevation, that also helps decrease the swelling as well. So they can do that. That doesn't require any critical thinking that is within their scope of practice. All right, which nursing action describes the action of committing assault? Would it be administering an injection to the patient that has refused it? Would it be failing to administer the proper dosage of a medication? Would it be administering medications uh, to keep a patient from waking up at night? Or would it be telling the patient that he or she will be restrained if they refuse an assessment? Which one is um, committing assault? Wow. 17 of you guys chose administering an injection that the patient refused. No. Assault is telling the patient that they'll be restrained if they refuse an assessment. So let me tell you guys what the difference between assault and battery is, because usually that's where you guys get confused. Even though you will hear those two phrases used interchangeably, they're not the same thing. Okay. So assault is the threat. When you threaten a patient to touch them or do something against their will, the threat alone is assault. So that's why telling a patient that you're going to restrain them if they don't do what you want, that's assault. Battery is following through with the threat. Okay. So you see administering an injection that the patient refused. That's battery. You actually did it. Next failing to administer the proper dosage of a prescription. When you don't do something that you've been trained to do that you should have done, what's that called? Negligence, okay? So that's negligence. Next, administering medications to keep um, a patient from waking up at night, what's that? False imprisonment. You're using um, chemical means to imprison your patient. That's false imprisonment. But again, when we're talking about the threat, it's assault. How are you guys doing on the live? Okay, let's keep going. Your patient states, every time I argue with my wife, I feel nauseated. What defense mechanism does this represent? Is it projection? Is it conversion? Is it displacement or reaction formation? What do you guys think? All right. The correct answer um, is conversion. And only eight of you guys chose that answer. So let me tell you what conversion is, guys. Conversion is when a person has an emotional or psychological conflict and it manifests as a physical symptom. So you have a nursing exam coming up and you're really nervous. And all of a sudden you got diarrhea or all of a sudden you got your stomach hurts. All of a sudden you have headache, right? What what you're really feeling is anxiety. You're really feeling the nervousness, but it's manifesting as a physical symptom. That's what conversion is. Let's talk about the other choices. Projection. Projection is when you take your emotions that you don't want to acknowledge and you put them on someone else, right? 
So you cannot stand Professor D because she's always yelling, but you tell everybody, oh, Professor D can't stand me when it's really the other way around. You're projecting your feelings onto someone else. Let's talk about displacement. What's displacement? Displacement is um, when you have feelings and you transfer those emotions onto something that's non-threatening. So you hate your boss. You can't stand your boss, but you can't curse them out because you're going to get fired. So you take those emotions and you transfer it to something less threatening to you. So you go home and you kick your dog or you beat your kids or you beat your wife because they're less threatening to you. They're not who you're really angry at. The person you're really angry at that you want to harm, you can't because they're more threatening. Okay. So that's what is known as displacement. And last, reaction formation. 16 of you guys chose reaction formation. Let me tell you guys what reaction formation is. Reaction formation is when you say the opposite of how you really feel. So you cannot stand Professor D again, but you think she yells too much, right? You think she's too spicy for your taste, but you go ahead and you tell anyone that will listen how much you love Professor D, right? When you really feel the opposite. So reaction formation is saying the opposite or acting the opposite. You're giving Professor D all these gifts when you know you really can't stand her. So it's behaving or verbalizing the opposite of how you really feel. Which assessment finding would the nurse anticipate to find in a patient with bulimia? Here are your choices. Lanugo, bradycardia, hypotension, amenorrhea. Which assessment finding would you expect to find in the patient that has bulimia? Okay. Wow. I'm so happy I did this Kahoot because you guys are getting this wrong and this is information you have to know. The correct answer is hypotension. Remember bulimia, this is the patient that um, will eat, 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 and then purge, eat, 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 and then purge. So every time they get nervous or their anxiety rises, they'll sit there and just eat and then they'll feel guilty about it. And then they'll vomit, they'll, you know, take laxatives, try to get rid of it. But that cycle all is due to um, anxiety that the patient has that builds up. The patient with bulimia, we tend to see hypotension, right? These other choices, Lanugo, those the those um, very thin, fine hairs, the bradycardia, that uh, low heart rate, the amenorrhea where the patient's um, of the age that they should be having their menstrual cycle and they're not having it. We tend to see that in patients with anorexia not bulimia. So make sure you guys know the clinical manifestations of anorexia versus bulimia. You have to know the difference. All right. Which prescription should the nurse recognize as a possible contributing factor to the extreme weight gain of a patient? Would it be insulin, laxatives, corticosteroids, or antihypertensive agents? All right, I see you guys have been studying on the live. Most of you have the correct answer. Very good. Cortical steroids. What do we know about cortical steroids? They increase the appetite. They change the distribution of fat. That's why you see those patients with Cushing's. They have like that, uh, um, what's it called? The moon face, the buffalo hump. They'll have um, um, large abdom uh, that large abdominal girth, right? because that change in fat distribution. Um, four things you guys need to know about corticosteroids. Number one, hyperglycemia. Increases blood sugar. Patient can mess around and become a diabetic off corticosteroids. Two, um, what's the second thing you have to know about corticosteroids? Oh, osteoporosis. They make the bones very por porous. So you're gonna be concerned about safety, right? Because a patient can break their bones very easy. Three, Ulcers. Steroids are very hard on the stomach. They can um, cause the patient to have an ulcer, even a bleeding ulcer. So that's why you always give it with food. You never give it on an empty stomach. And the fourth thing you got to know about um, a steroids are um, infection. 
They can mask the signs and symptoms of infection. Remember, it decreases inflammation. So any patients that are on steroids, you better check them much, 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 much closer, right? You're going to be paying close attention to the WBCs. You're going to be paying close attention to the patient's temperature and all those other signs and symptoms of infection that you'd be looking out for. All right, type in your answer. You have an order to administer 500 milliliters of normal saline to be infused over three hours. Your drop factor is 15 drops per milliliter. How many drips per minute are you going to calculate? Go ahead, do the math, guys. Your order to give 500 mLs to infuse over three hours. Your drip drops per mL is 15. How many drops per minute are you going to give? You're almost there, king of the hill. Kiara, you're almost there. You have one more step. Santan, you have one more step. This is important, don't forget. Forty one, thirty three, forty one point seven, twenty five hundred. <laughs> All right, guys, the correct answer is forty two. Now, a lot of you on the live, what I saw you doing, I saw your answer was forty one point seven. Let me ask you something. When you're talking about drops, think of a raindrop, right? Can you have half of a raindrop? No. Drop is always going to be a whole number. So when you have forty one point seven, what does that round to? Forty two. You can't have a partial of a drop, right? So guys, don't forget when you get to the end and you calculate it, if we're talking about drops and it points something, you're either rounding up or down, okay? So the correct answer is 42. So let's talk about how we got this for anybody that doesn't know how to do the nursing math. When you're trying to figure out how to do drops per minute, the formula that you're gonna use is a total volume times your drop factor all over time in minute. Total volume is 500 mLs. So you're gonna do 500 mLs times 15 all over time in minutes. Time in minutes is what? Three hours times 60 because there's 60 minutes in an hour. So you're gonna do 500 times 15, which gives you 7,500, all over three times 60, which gives you 180. 180 goes into 7,500, 41.6 times, 41.6. But guess what? Can you get 41.6 of a drop? Absolutely not. So that 41.6 turns into what? 42. And that's how we end up giving 42 drops per minute. Next question, select all that applies. Your patient serum sodium is 132. Which assessment finding would you anticipate as a nurse? Select all that apply. Vomiting, tachycardia, hypotension, disorientation, Shostek sign, Trousseau sign. What do you think? Your patient's serum sodium is 132 milliequivalents per liter. What signs and symptoms would you expect to assess in this type of patient? Okay, <laughs> let's talk about this. Um, everything, oh, why did I? Okay, so let's talk about this. Um, vomiting, well, before I even get into uh, the symptoms, let's talk about that serum of the sodium serum, serum sodium level of 132. Your normal range is 135 to 145. 
135 to 145. Okay, so the fact that the patient's sodium level is 132, that means they're hyponatremic, right? The sodium level's low. I made a mistake because I'm going to tell you why. With low sodium, yes, you expect to see vomiting. Yes, you expect to see tachycardia. Yes, you expect to see disorientation, but you see hypotension. I don't know why, because I could have sworn I marked it as correct, but it's saying incorrect, but I'm telling you right now. Yes, if that patient's sodium level is low, you are going to expect hypotension and it makes sense. I'm going to explain to you why. What does sodium do? It draws in fluid. Sodium holds on to fluid. So the more sodium you have, the more fluid you have. The more fluid you have, the more pressure against the vascular space. What is blood pressure? Pressure against the vascular space. So with that sodium being low, you expect that, expect that fluid to be low and you expect the blood pressure to be low. Okay, so I do apologize for that because it's saying no on hypotension and the correct answer, yes, on hypotension. All of these, except for the last two, you would expect to see in the patient that's hyponatremic. Why not Chostec or Trousseau sign? Can anyone on the live tell me Chostec or Trousseau sign? That's a clinical manifestation of what? Thank you. Anita said calcium. And to be specific, hypocalcemia. When the calcium is too low in um, the blood, you can see muscle and nerve irritation such as Trousseau or Chostec sign. Chostec sign starts with a C. And your cheek starts with a C. So the way you remember Chostec sign, when you run your finger along the patient's cheek, their face will start spazzing like that. That's Chostec sign. Trousseau sign is Trousseau is a type of tetany. When you take the patient's blood pr pressure and the um, cuff starts to squeeze, you'll see their heart, their heart, you'll see their hand start to do this. It's a type of tetany. So you see Chostec and Trousseau in hypocalcemia, but all these other symptoms, including hypotension, you see in hypo natremia okay all right your patient scheduled for a procedure that requires contrast medium which lab finding would be most concerning to you would it be a platelet count of 150,000 would it be creatinine of 2.2 would it be a potassium of 5 or would it be a BUN or oh, I didn't even tell you what the BUN is all right let's say the BUN's 30 I didn't put the BUN on there the BUN is 30. What's going to be concerning to you? A BUN of 30, potassium of 5, creatinine of 2.2, or platelet count of 150,000? Okay. Um, you guys chose um, creatinine of 2.2. So let's talk about that. And that is high. I should have made the BUN lower. The Let's go over the wrong answers first. Do I want to do that? No, let's talk about this diagnostic test first. Then we'll go over the answers. So um, contrast medium. Your patient's getting contrast medium. Why do we care about that? Why would we? Wh why does that even raise a red flag for us? The reason it raise a, raises a red flag for us is because we know contrast medium is very hard on what? The kidneys. Makes your kidneys work harder to flush it out right? So that's why after patients had contrast medium, you're going to go ahead and give them lots of fluids to drink because um, we know it's hard on the kidneys. With that being said, the fact that I told you it's hard on the kidneys, you should have been looking at the BUN and the creatinine, right? The BUN, which I told you is 30, which would be high because normal is 8 to 22, and creatinine, which is also high because right here it says 2.2, but normal creatinine is about 0 0.8 to 1.2. Both of them are high. How would you choose? How would you decide to choose which one if both of them are high? I'm telling you right now. When it comes to the kidney, specifically, if you have to choose one lab uh, being out of range to be concerned, it's going to be creatinine. Creatinine is more specific to the kidneys. When you see the creatinine elevated, you know we're talking about the kidneys. When you see the BUN elevated, yes, it could be the kidneys, but it may be something going on. Um, on with the patient's metabolic status. It could be something going on with the patient's heart. There are other conditions that can cause the BUN to be increased. But when we see that creatinine increase, we know we're looking at the kidneys. And we know in this type of question is the kidneys we're concerned about because it's contrast medium and the contrast medium makes the kidneys work harder. We're worried about the kidneys being in trouble. Nothing wrong with platelet count of 150,000 because guess what? Your normal platelet count should be 150, 450,000. Remember, the platelets are important to keep you from hemorrhaging out. 
nothing wrong with the potassium. Normal range of potassium is what? 3.5 to 5. So it's still within therapeutic range. So for this, the correct answer, guys, is creatinine of 2.2. All right, I want you to drop the pin. In which location would you identify the site for the stoma of a patient of a patient scheduled for an um ileostomy? Go ahead and drop your location. <laughs> okay. Some of you guys got it right. So we're talking about um, an ileostomy. Where would we expect if patients having a stoma for an ileostomy, where would we expect that opening to be? Remember guys, with an ileostomy, you have the small intestine is being diverted through where? The right lower quadrant, this area right here. Okay. This is where you would expect it to be. The right lower quadrant. All right, puzzle, I want you to put this in order. Your patient's having a seizure. I want you to list your actions in order of priority. What are you going to do? First, second, third, fourth. Here's your choices. You're going to turn the patient on their left side. You're going to ease the patient onto the ground. You're going to reorient the patient and take their vital signs, and you're going to place a pillow under their head. Something I don't have on here, but you definitely need to know when your patient has a seizure, when it begins, you need to look at the time. And when the seizure ends, you also need to look at the time. And the reason you're concerned about that, you need to know the duration of the seizure. That must be reported to the healthcare provider because the duration makes a big difference in the medical plan that the healthcare provider is going to come for the patient. Okay. All right. So 17 of you guys got this right. Your patient has a seizure. The first thing you're going to do, if they're standing or sitting, you're going to ease them onto the ground. Then Yep. Then you're going to turn your patient onto their left side. After you turn them onto their left side, you're going to put the pillow under their head. And I want you to think about that. Why would we turn them to the left side before we put the pillow under their head? Airway, breathing, circulation. Who cares about protecting the brain if they're not breathing? If they're not breathing, is there oxygen going to the brain? No. So what are we protecting at this point? So you want to protect their airway first. So you're going to turn them onto their left side. We want to decrease the risk of aspiration. Then we're going to put the pillow under their head. That patient has a seizure. After that, you're going to reorient them. You're going to have the bed in the lowest position, side rails up. You're going to take the patient's vital signs, call the healthcare provider with your findings. All right, type in your answer. There are five diagnoses in which pain is a priority. Pain never killed anyone except for five diagnoses where pain is a priority. Myocardial infarction is one. Name the other four. Or name another because it's five. And I told you one, which is myocardial infarction. Can you name one more out of the four? You guys are doing the most on the live, guys. No, you don't have pain and dementia. Stones, cancer, leukemia, TBI. All right. Other than myocardial infarction, what are the other four diagnoses that pain is a priority? You're going to treat pain. 
as you would anything else that caught, falls under physiological integrity, such as glucose, such as fluid and electrolytes, such as nutrition, such as excessive um, uh, uh, diarrhea, excessive vomiting, dehydration, uh, blood pressure, pulse, respirations, heart rate, all of those, right? You would treat pain just as important as all those things I just mentioned in these five diagnoses, myocardial infarction, sickle cell crisis, burns, cancer, and stones. And it doesn't matter what type of stones. They could be calcium stones. They could be screwdriver stones. They could be gallbladder stones. They could be kidney stones. Patients got stones. You're going to treat pain as a priority. All right, guys, we're going on to our last question. Which primary intervention would you initiate for your patient who's just been admitted for a burn? Would it be to initiate an IV, obtain ECG, maintain temperature, encourage the patient to describe their feelings about the incident? Um, it's electrical burn. I don't know why I didn't put electrical, but it's an electrical burn. This patient had an electrical burn. That type of burn makes a difference. Your patient's just been admitted for an electrical burn. So let's say they were hit by, what's this thing called? It's not called thunder. Thunder is the noise. Lightning. Okay. So the correct answer, obtain ECG. Because any patient that has an electrical burn, we're concerned about that patient having some type of cardiac dysrhythmia. So immediately you need to obtain an ECG. And guess what? Obtaining an ECG, that's what? Getting information, that's what? An assessment. That is the first part of the nursing process, getting information, assessment, right? Any questions on the live? That's right. You need to get a baseline cardiac arrhythmia. That's what we're going to be concerned about the, the most. Okay, guys, this was great. Um, you tend to do much better on my cahoots. I'm going to make more uh, topics that are have been seen on exit exams just to make sure you guys have a better understanding on these topics and you guys just uh, really understand the subject matter. So there's going to be more to come. Let's see how you guys did.